wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Will you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Will you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power. Power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. For those of you who are new, Tonight, we invite you to register for our free Bible lessons and for the free magazine. Just fill up the long part. That is, currently we are doing it online. We used to do this, but uh, we are doing it online. Make sure that you'll be able to register so that we can be easily be able to know who will be receiving lessons and how much and how many will we be printing on a daily basis? We shall have to give out gifts. After attending 10 lectures, you will get this Hidden Truth magazine for free. So make sure that you sign in. You log in while you're coming in every evening to attend the lectures. Tonight's lesson for our registered participants is entitled Rescue from Above rescue from above we invite you to fill up the summary page that is at the back of the lesson when you have time and then turn it to our registration team they will grade it and return it to you in the next day equally tonight's lesson for our registered uh, participants is entitled rescue from above and you can be able to see it clearly on the wall we invite you at the same time you can be able to see the sheet there and we let you know that uh, as we finish these lessons after the end of our study we will have uh, a graduation and a certificate for diploma over the studies that have been so extensive in the course of this period of prophecies of hope what topics are coming up what topics are coming up we have uh, a few topics ahead of us. Tomorrow, Wednesday night, our topic will be worldwide shutdown, Christ returns. There are several theories concerning what will take place on earth when Christ comes back. Will it be a secret event? Will all the righteous mysterious disappear? What really will happen? Will we find, we'll be able to find out tomorrow night? Then on Wednesday night, that is on Thursday night, we will study the Antichrist, the Antichrist cover-up. There is a cover-up concerning the Antichrist. Be here Thursday night to learn the amazing facts about the Antichrist cover-up. On the Friday night, we will study about the two matters of revelation. The two matters of revelation. Have you heard about them? Who are they? And what happened to them? We will be able to find out on Friday night about them. Then on Saturday night is the topic that Satan hates. What is that? Be here to find out. If you have any problems getting here on Saturday night, you will be able to understand why. Because Saturday night is topic. Really is the topic that Satan uh, hates. And therefore, without much ado, as we begin our study this evening, I want us to stand for a word of prayer 
and then we enter into our lectures. Let's stand for the word of prayer as we begin our study for tonight. Let's pray. Our Father and our God who lives in heaven, glory and honor be unto you forever. We are so grateful for what you've done to us, and we want to thank you for your faithfulness. As we study your word, we invite you to walk with us, to fill us with that whole spirit, give us the power to grasp and to understand, and above all, convict us with that whole spirit in great abundance. Put words onto my mouth, use me mightily as it may please you. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our subject for tonight is the Omega Mystery. Revelation is sacred to personal power. We have come to probably the most technological, advanced kind of uh, age in history. We live in the hour of power and technology. And apart from that, we have all sorts of gadgets, inventions, and improvements to make life easier and more entertaining. Sometimes I get shocked. You see, I'm a businessman. And um, I deal with electronics and uh, more especially the smartphones and the, and the laptops. And I wonder, and I'm amazed from time to time with the inventions of the new gadgets that are coming into market from time to time. You see, apart from that, apart from the inventions that are taking place, one of the most shocking things is that our inventions and advancements, modern man is more enslaved to bad habits than probably any past age. The world at large is enslaved to bad habits such as alcohol, tobacco, lust, and drugs. And it seems that they have no power to break free from such. Who can provide us with personal power? We have lots of technology, inventions, and power sources. But where do we find personal power? Could it be that Jesus is the source of personal power? The answer is yes. The Bible says in John chapter number 1, verse number 12, mark down the text tonight, but as many as received him, that is Jesus Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Would you like to have power in your life? then what you need in your life is to receive Jesus. When you receive Jesus, you receive what? Power. What the world needs today is not more computers, all power companies, all more technology. What the world needs today is Jesus Christ. When we receive him, we receive power. And well, how much power does Jesus have? Let's read the answer from Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 18, to know how much power Jesus has. This Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So how much power does Jesus have? He has all the power of heaven and all the power of earth. How much power is that? That is unlimited power. So when you receive Jesus you are receiving unlimited power in your life. And the question is, would you like power in your life? Then what you need is actually to receive Jesus. The variation is secret of power is Jesus Christ. And uh, in revelation, he is called the Alpha and the Omega, all the A and the Z of power. Let's read about the Alpha and the Omega from the book of Revelation, chapter number 21, verse number 6. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I'll give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Are you thirst spiritually? You can come to Jesus and have your spiritual thirst satisfied. But it's called here the Alpha and the Omega. And the question that we have here, what is Alpha? Actually, that is the first letter of the Greek 
alphabet. What about the omega? That is the last letter. And if Jesus was speaking to us in English, he would say, I am the A and the Z, that is Z, and everything in between, if he could be speaking in our language today. Revelation is Alpha and Omega is Jesus Christ. He is the Alpha and Omega of history. He is the Alpha and the Omega of prophecy. But the question is, is he the Alpha and the Omega in your life? The first and the last, and the best and everything in between. He is all you need for power, peace, hope, and salvation. And beloved, the Bible says, let's read this all together. As many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he power. That is John chapter number 1, verse number 12. Would you like power in your life, friend? Then what you need is to receive Jesus. The Alpha and Omega of personal power. All history has been affected by Jesus Christ. B.C., before Christ. A.D., Anno Dominol. In the year of our Lord, virtually every world religion agrees that he was a good man. Some say he was a prophet, others a moral teacher, all a philosopher. But few will deny his existence. The existence of Jesus is a historical event and fact. But if that is all he was, just a moral teacher, just a philosopher, just a prophet, then he cannot provide us with the personal power that we need. You see, beloved, a philosopher can give us an ideology. A moral teacher can be able to give us what is right from what is wrong. But the fact is, most of us already know what is right from what is wrong. Don't we? We do. Take smoking, for example. Most people know that smoking is very dangerous for their health, bad to their lungs, bad to the environment. By the way, let me tell you, even the companies that manufacture a cigarette, they are instructed to put outside the packets danger, onyo, uvutaji wa sigara, usababisha saratani ya kimabavu. Kumanisha kwamba, they want to warn you prior to. Meaning, you have knowledge in advance. My beloved, they say, I know it is harmful, and I don't like to quit, and I could like to quit, but I just don't have the power to quit. I was last week on Sunday, Sunday of 29th, doing uh, uh, campaigns for drug abuse, and that is a uh, 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 th th that is drug campaign for people to quit uh, taking drugs. And we were in Kawa West in one of the ghettos called Soweto. And we met a young man who was saying, Maze mini nimetaka kuachana na imi adharati, but nimejaribu kama maradhau. Na tulikuwa tumempea Mike. Nimejaribu kama maradhau. Na bado napata nimerudi. Beloved, such a statement normally catch me very much. Someone wants to quit a habit, but they can hardly make it. It's not that we don't know what is right. We don't have the power to do what is right. And we need more than someone to tell us what is right. We need someone who can be able to give us the power to do that which is right. Will it be that Jesus is actually the one who can be able to give us the power? The Bible says... As many as received who? Jesus. To them he gave the power. Now question. Do Christians need to receive Jesus? Yes. I am amazed at how many powerless Christians there are. They act like Christ. Usually when they are at church. But at home during the week. They act more like Antichrist. <laughs> Yesterday on Sunday. I was driving, I told you, I was uh, having a wedding with my, for my sister. And I was driving from my place right to the church in Nairobi South. And just as I'm leaving and I was shitting a corner, I've taken a turn. I meet a lady is coming. You see, normally when the road is narrow, instructions from driving are stop and give way. She was supposed to stop and give me way to pass. 
And then she proceeds. She's seeing that I'm advancing. And she stood on the middle of the Lord. I could not go back because there was a car that was coming from behind me. And you know what she told me? That is Sunday morning. She re reversed. And when I almost approached her, she told me, Shukuru Mungu nilikuwa naenda kanisa. Sing a song nyuma. You see, I thought through the statement all along. This is a lady telling me, Shukuru nilikuwa naenda kanisa. Meaning that her salvation is situational, conditional. Ameokoka kwa sababu hiyo siku anaenda kanisani. Beloved, that is a tragedy of how much we and how much of the church has been affected and how, homely, uh, how powerless we are. And beloved, many Christians like, act like Christ usually when they are at church, but at home, during the week, they act more like the Antichrist. Whenever someone does you wrong and you feel self-rising for justification or to fight back, what do you need? You need to receive Jesus. When you feel, actually when you know what is right, but you feel like doing wrong, what do you need? You re need to receive Jesus. And beloved, I want to let you know that it is the power of the Lord that he takes care of his children. You see, uh, when I was growing up, I, I, I used to admire the Taekwondo very much. And therefore, when uh, I had time after moving away from the parents, I joined Taekwondo even years before joining college. And I did it for many years until it, it, it totally disjointed myself. And uh, when I got a girlfriend and I wanted to marry, one of the things that I had to learn to quit was Taekwondo. Sometimes you see these things that you hear, ha, ha. I could do them in the night, unconsciously. Ha, ha. Natua take evi, natua net ju. Neti menifunika. And I began to struggle. You see, we call these things self-defense. Another day I'm coming, we are coming actually from Technical University. I'm, 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 with a child at the back, another one carrying a kiondo, and the guy came, hit the baby, took the kiondo. You see, we are walking with my girlfriend, and I'd not explained everything about my life. I'd not put my CV open. You see, when you go to apply for a job, you say, tell us about yourself. And you see, that thing, the spirit, Pepo Ndaniangu, sprang up. And I felt that I should sing, uh, actually swing into action. I was carrying a bag with a laptop, and I'd come from preaching on Sabbath evening. I took the bag, gave to my wife. Now she's my wife, she was my girlfriend then. Gave to my wife. You see, she didn't know what I was doing. And then I sprang, sprang, did a somersault, and then a double kick on the chest of this tall, huge guy, down to the floor. I stepped on the head, got into the trouser, lifted him up, put him on my knee. And you see, I snatched the bag. Then the conscience came back. You see, during that time, my girlfriend looked at me like this. She didn't talk. We walked to the stage. We boarded a matatu together. We were students, of course. We boarded the matatu together. She didn't talk to me. You see, normally when she gets home, I text, dear, Ushafika. She didn't talk to me for the next how many weeks? She only wrote me a text. I think I'm dating a wrong person. And you know the reply I gave? Dear, I will explain. <laughs> you can't know how much I struggle with this, beloved. I began to pray that God take off this thing from me. Because the fear... Someone was threatening to leave me on the stars, actually on the crossroads. And um, I used to pray that God help me that this thing may get off my shoulders. Beloved, I want to let you know that I thank the Lord. I was able to come out of that through God's power.
and I know anyone who might be admiring such a kind of things that you normally th I, do you have taekwondo classes here is anyone a member here you'll come for notes such a spirit when I read deep about it I had to understand that other things you see when you go you walk to taekwondo class immediately with the white clothes and then um, the attire and the black belt here you're going for classes the first thing that you do who are you worshipping in this case? Beloved, that will be a lesson for another day. But the question is this. We need to receive Jesus every waking moment of the day. Every time. But does Jesus really have the power, the kind of power, the power to claim my life and change, to change my life completely? He claimed to. Actually, Jesus made many amazing claims when he was here on earth about the abundance of power that he has. Number one, he claimed to be God. John chapter 10, verse number 27 to 30. And apart from that, now he, he was either uh, what he claimed to be or he was an imposter. And we know that an imposter is a very good man, but he was a God. He was not just a good man, he was God. He is God. He claimed, number two, pre-existence. John chapter 8 verse number 58 and John chapter 17 verse number 5. Number three, he claimed to be the Messiah. John chapter 4 verse number 26. Number four, omnipotence. Jesus claimed to be omnipotent. Matthew chapter 28 verse number 18. Number five, Jesus claimed to know the future. John chapter 13, verse number 19. Number six, the power to forgive sins. He claimed to have such a power. Matthew chapter 9, verse number two. Number seven, Jesus claimed to know money's thoughts. So whichever that you might be thinking about, you can check out John chapter two, verse number 25. And that is not just all. Listen to what Jesus did. He claimed to be, number one, the way and the truth. John chapter 4, verse number 6. Number two, the resurrection and the life. John chapter 11, verse number 25. Number three, the door. John chapter 10, verse number 7. Number four, he claimed to be the living bread. John chapter 6, verse number 51. Number five, Jesus claimed to be the good shepherd. John chapter 15, verse number 1. Number six, he claimed to to be the light of the world. John chapter 8 verse number 12. Number 7. Jesus claimed to be without sin. John chapter 8 verse number 46. Those are just a few of the claims that Jesus made. Friends. Either Jesus was all that he claimed to be. Or he is actually the greatest imposter that ever lived. We are going to discover tonight. That Jesus Christ is all that he claimed to be and is so much more let's go on a pilgrimage tonight and consider the biography of jesus because it is the only way that we can be able to understand who he was and is and the power that he offers that your life can be changed christ is actually the only one who wrote his biography before he was even born and jesus invites us to study his biography with a, a deep interest. He said in John chapter 5 verse number 39, put that text in your notes tonight, search the scriptures for in them you might, you think you have eternal life and they are which testify of me. When Jesus said search the scriptures, what part of the Bible did people have to search? Beloved, you may know that the Bible actually is actually written in two parts. The Old Testament, that is before Christ, and the New Testament after Christ. So when Jesus said, search the scriptures, what scriptures did he have to search? The Old Testament, during that time, the New Testament had not been written. And Jesus said to them that they, that is the Old Testament, is the one that testifies of me. 
So let's do that tonight. We will actually search the Old Testament scriptures and we will discover that the Old Testament foretold that is the place of his birth, the manner of his birth, his betrayal, the manner of his death, all written out in advance. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies. Of course, you see, he is the Alpha and the Omega. It has been estimated that the probability of just eight of these 300 prophecies being fulfilled in one man's life is actually one with 33. One in the three seconds after eight. All one after 330 years after each. What number will it be if we included the more than 300 prophecies about the Messiah, that is Jesus Christ, that he fulfilled on earth while he was living. Let's consider tonight just a few of the many prophecies of Old Testament uh, prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. Prophecy predicted that he would be born of a virgin. That is prophecy. That was prophesied in John in, in Isaiah chapter 7 verse number 14 and fulfilled about 700 years later according to Luke chapter number 1 verse number 26 to 38. Christ is the only one who actually ever was born of a virgin. Did you get that statement? He is the only one ever to be born of a virgin. Whichever that you choose to do with that statement is all about you. Prophecy predicted the place of Christ's birth. Born in Bethlehem. That was prophesied in Micah chapter number 5 verse number 2. And again fulfilled about 700 years later. In Luke chapter 2 verse number 1 to 20. And beloved, you know, sometimes I get amazed. It was prophesied and almost 700 years later, exactly. You see, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But what was his original home? Nazareth. But at the fullness of the time, so as the prophecies to align with the events, he has to be born. Something had to happen. Let me tell you, beloved, God is busy ensuring that the, pro the prophecies of his word are, are fulfilled exactly as his word says. Prophets also foretold his ministry in Isaiah chapter number 6, verse number 6 to 1, verse number 1 to 2. And that, that was fulfilled in all four Gospels. Let's read the prophecy in Isaiah chapter number 6 to 1, verse number 1. This is a prophecy predicting the ministry of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 61, verse number 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. Note, the, note that word, anointed. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 10, verse number 38, that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. When did he do that? When did he do that? At Christ's baptism, of course. That is when the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. Christ was then anointed and began his public ministry. So it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto me, unto the meek. Good tidings means good news. And where do you go for your good news these days? Is it CNN? Al Jazeera? BBC? Where do you go for the good news? It seems that all that we find there is actually bad news. Where do we go for the good news? That is the Bible. The good news that you can be forgiven. The good news that your guilt can be gone. The good news that you can be saved. The good news that Jesus is preparing a mansion in heaven for you. We need good news these days and we find it in the word of God. The prophecy continues, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Is there someone who is suffering from a blow? Who is, whose pieces need to be collected this evening? Are you brokenhearted tonight? You can bring your broken pieces of your shattered life to Jesus. He is still healing broken hearts today. He alone 
can be able to heal your heart. That is Christ Jesus alone can be able to heal your heart. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Jesus actually came to set the captives free. Whatever bad habits you find yourself in bondage tonight, may it be drugs, lust, tobacco, alcohol, or some other bad habits, Jesus can set you free. Praise the Lord. A young man named Andrew actually began attending a series of lectures like this. Andrew was a, a Satan worshiper. He had 66, actually 66 six tattooed on both wrists. He had an altar to the devil in his home. But Andrew began to realize that he was in bondage. And uh, in bondage to the demons. And what happened? And when... They wanted to condemn her and accuse Jesus too. But Jesus dismissed the accusers. And instead of condemning the woman, Jesus forgave her and said to her, Go and sin no more. Beloved, and in the power of Jesus, that woman began a new life. An empowered life. And friend, you too can begin a new life by receiving Jesus. The Bible says, read with me, as many as received Jesus, to them he gave what? Power. You too can live an empowered life by receiving Jesus. Some of the most amazing prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus deal actually with the timing of the Messiah. Jesus Christ came right on time to fulfill time prophecy. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4 verse number 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent for the Son. Beloved, prophecy actually foretold when the Messiah will appear and when he will be able to die. Tonight, I'm going to give you mathematical evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. Math is an exact science. Do you like math? Do you like math? Okay. How many of you absolutely love mathematics? You see... 
I'm a mathematician personally because I did telecommunication and information engineering. And if uh, I choose to be a lecturer, I'll be proud to teach maths. It doesn't need much of the brains. Have you ever known that? <laughs> By the way, math does not need much of the, the. It is the same. Just know the formula and that is it. You just move with the numbers. You don't have to struggle with it. It's not like history where you are told to give the 10 reasons for apartheid in South Africa. And then you say, who? And then you hear, you reach number six and you can't find the four. Then you begin. No, 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 no. Beloved, but this is easy math, so don't worry about it. We find the mathematics evidence in Daniel chapter number 9, verse number 24 to 27. This is the time prophecy of the Messiah, predicting his arrival and the date of his death. Let's begin by reading verse number 24. The Bible says, 70 weeks are determined upon the, thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliations for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So here is the prophecy we have. 70 weeks for Daniel's people. Who were Daniel's people? That is the Jews or the Hebrews. The angel Gabriel says, 70 weeks will be for your people. Here is our mathematics now. 70 weeks times 7 days to the week is how many days? That is 490. That is easy. I have the answer for you on the screen, of course. You don't have to think about it. But in prophecy, a day represents what? Anybody who knows? A day represents what in prophecy? A year, of course. Let me give you a couple of texts to prove that. God said in Ezekiel chapter number 4, verse number 6, I have appointed thee each day for a year. Then in Numbers chapter 14, verse number 34, God says, each day for a year. So in Bible prophecy, one prophetic day represents one literal year. That is just in prophetic parts of the Bible. Everywhere else, a day is simply 20, a 24-hour period. The seven days of creation were literal 24 hours, and the day that 24 hours are days. But when you are studying Bible prophecy with its symbols, God says that a day in prophecy is equal to a literal year of time. If you would like another text that proves that, mark down Genesis chapter number 29, verse number 27. In Bible prophecy, one prophetic day is equal to one literal year. Now let's come back to the time prophecy of Daniel chapter number 9. Since we are looking at the, a prophecy here, 490 days will be what? That will be 490 literal years. Now, 490 prophetic days represents 490 literal years. Here is our time prophecy for Daniel's people, the Hebrews. But the next question, of course, is when does this 70 week, 490 uh, year period to begin? What will be the starting date? We will actually get the answer from verse number 25. Daniel chapter 9 verse number 25 mark that in your notes tonight what does the Bible say the Bible says know therefore and understand that from from what the going from the going forth of the commandment all decree that is to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So this week, 490 uh, prophecy will begin from the decree to restore and to build Jerusalem. When Daniel received this vision, Jerusalem actually was in ruins. 
it had been destroyed by the Babylonians. In this verse, the angel is telling Daniel, Daniel that when the decree goes out for you to restore and build your city, that will be the starting date. When was uh, that date that will begin this 70-week prophecy? When was that? The decree to restore and to build Jerusalem was in the fall B.C. That decree was issued by Altaxis, king of Medopasia. You can read the actual decree from uh, the book of Ezra in chapter 7, verse number 11 to 26. This is one of the most clearly established Bible dates, 457 B.C., in the, later, uh, in the latter part of the year. The encyclopedia confirms this too. What does it say? It says, under the date 457 B.C., Wikipedia states, Altaxis I decrees that the city government of Jerusalem shall be reestablished. You can see that one in, Daniel, in Ezra, Ezra chapter 7, Daniel chapter number 9, and in Nehemiah chapter number 1 in the Old Testament. What here was that? 457 B.C in latter part of that very same year. Now we have the starting date. That is 457. From that date, 457, there will be a 490-year period for the Jews. And during that time, Messiah will come. Let's go back and read the prophecy again. Let's go back and read the prophecy again. The Bible says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment or decree to restore and to build Jerusalem, what year was that? The latter part of 457 BC. Unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in travelers' times. Beloved, from the commandment, all the decree to restore Jerusalem unto the Messiah will be what? Seven weeks and three score. As core is 20, uh, and uh, 20 times 3, that will give us 60. And two weeks, all 62 weeks. Let's come back to our maths. Let's do the math now. From, that is when the commandment was given unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Seven weeks plus 62 weeks is equal to what? Seven plus 62? That is 69 weeks. This is easy math. Uh, 69 weeks is how many days? 69 weeks is how many days? 483. That is 66. That is 69 times 7. But we are studying a prophecy so that that will be 483 literal what? Years, of course. Let's move on with our math. This will bring us down unto the Messiah. Let's diagram that. We need to put that one on diagram. The Bible needs math. The Bible needs genius of the brain. The, the Bible is actually not for the academic dwarves. It needs some thinking. And that is why you see, when you see people jumping in the streets, I prophesy. Beloved, the Bible needs thinkers. We have our starting date, of course, for the prophets, 457 BC. The decree to restore Jerusalem. 70 weeks, all 490 years from that date will be for the Jews. 69 weeks, all 483 years, will bring us down to the appearing of the Messiah. Now notice, uh, 69 weeks is one week less than the total 70 weeks for the Jews. 483 years is seven years less than the total 490 years for the Jews. So, after the Messiah appears, there will be one more week, all seven years remaining. And remember that, because we will come back to that point later this evening. From the decree 
to restore Jerusalem until the anointing of the Messiah will be 69 prophetic weeks or how many years? 483 years. Let's diagram it. Actually, let's diagram it this way. 69 weeks times 7 days per week equals 483 days or 493 literal years. A year uh, because a day equals what in prophecy? A year. So there is 403 years from the decree to the Messiah's anointing. We have our starting date, that is 457, in the latter part of the year. 403 years will bring us down to where? To AD 27 in the latter uh, part of that very same year. Let's calculate this. We take our 403 years and subtract the beginning date, which is 457. What do we get? 483 minus 457? 26. Uh, you say, I thought it was 27. Let's figure it this way. If you subtract 457 from 457, what is the mathematical answer? Zero. Was there a zero here? Do we have a zero here? No, of course, we do not. And therefore, because we do not have a zero here, so instead of having zero, we must put one AD. That is uh, 26 plus one. That is equals to 27 AD. The year the Messiah was to appear. That was the exact year that the Messiah was supposed to appear. Let's, let's illustrate it this way. Mathematically, you go from negative to zero, then to positive one. That is uh, in the number line. But historically, there was no zero here. And uh, so instead of a zero here, we put AD1. In history, you go from 1 BC to 1 AD. You can think of changing. You see in BC, you come down, and then in AD, you, you advance as you go up. Uh, let me illustrate it. Let's imagine I'm here at 3 BC. Look at the 3 BC here. This is 3 BC. This is 3 AD. And then um, I take a step. I come to 2 BC. You can be able to see that. Now I'm at 1 BC. I'm moving from 3 BC, 2 BC, 1 BC. And I want to transition to another uh, what is my next step from 1 BC here? What is my next step? It's actually supposed to be 1 AD. It is mathematically supposed to be 0 here, but because we do not have a 0 here, so we transition automatically to what? To 1. Uh, there was no 0 here, and that is why we put it 1. You go from 1 BC to 1 AD. You must remember that when you do that calculations a full 483 years from the latter part of 457 BC brings you to the latter part of AD 27 question what was happening in AD 27 what was happening in AD 27 beloved come back here the bible tells us in Luke chapter 3 verse number 1 exactly what was happening during that period now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, what year? The 15th year. History tells us that actually began to rule in AD 12. That is Tiberius Caesar. Began to rule in AD 12. So his 15th year will be what date? Will be what date? 27 AD, of course. Let's do that math. It is 12 AD plus 15 here since he began to rule and that is 27 AD. The 15th year of Tiberius' rule uh, was AD 27. What was happening during that time? Love it, listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, what year was that? AD 27. He, that is John the Baptist, came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And guess who came to be baptized? Jesus himself. 
what was the here? AD 27. Now follow carefully. Messiah in Hebrew means anointed one. Christ in Greek means anointed one. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 10 verse number 38 that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. When was Jesus, when was Christ anointed with the Holy Spirit? When was that? Of course, AD 27 at his baptism. Luke chapter 3 verse number 21 and 22 tells us that the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove and the Father spoke from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God publicly proclaimed Jesus to be the expected Messiah. What date was that? AD 27, after his baptism, Jesus began to preach. And he began to preach, and he began to preach by saying, Field, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repe repent ye and believe the gospel. That is Mark chapter number 1, verse number 15. What time was fulfilled? The time of prophecy of Daniel chapter number 9. Jesus was saying, the Messiah is supposed to be here. Here I am, right on time, exactly according to the prophecy of Daniel chapter number 9. Let's return to our diagram. We have 490 years for the Jews. 483 years, all, 400, all 69 weeks, brings us to the Messiah's baptism. That we have one extra week, all seven years between AD 27 and the conclusion of this 490 uh, year period. Let's diagram that final week. We have our beginning date, that is the decree 457 BC. If we add 483 years, we come to the Messiah's baptism, AD 27. But Jesus had to do his mission for how many years? Three and a half years after his baptism, Christ died on the cross. That was the spring uh, or early uh, part of AD 31 when Jesus died on the cross. That was also predicted in Daniel chapter number 9. The Bible says in Daniel chapter number 9 verse 26, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. What does it mean to cut off? That means he will die. You can be able to see that in Isaiah chapter 55, 53 verse number 8. Who did, who did he die for, beloved? Of course for you and me. But when exactly will he be cut off or die? Verse number 27 says, in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, And he, who is the he, that is Christ Jesus, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. One week is how long? seven days, all seven years. And in the midst of the week, middle of the seven will be what? Three and a half. He shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, all to come to an end. So in the middle of the week, all in the middle of the seven years, Jesus died on the cross. That was three, hundred, three, uh, three and a half years after his baptism. In the spring or early part of AD that one, Daniel chapter number 9 verse number 27 tells us that Christ will confirm the covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will bring an end to sacrifices completely. You see back in the Old Testament, whenever, whenever the people sinned, they would sacrifice a lamb for their sins in order to be forgiven. The lamb would die in the place of a sinner. And whom did the lamb represent? Jesus, the lamb of God, who died in our place. So in the early part of AD 31, Christ was crucified in exactly, in exact fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel chapter number 9, verse number 27. And when he died on the cross, he brought to an end to all, uh, he actually brought to an, uh, an end to all the Old Testament sacrifices. That is why Daniel chapter number 9, verse number 27 says, and he, who is that? The Messiah shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That is, that is all seven years. And in the midst of the week, three and a half years, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. We don't need to offer up 
lamps uh, for our sins anymore because Jesus, the Lamb of God, brought to an end to all those types and ceremonies by his death on the cross. Beloved, someone was preaching in a youth week of uh, a youth Sabbath in some church in Nairobi. The leader approached me, a friend, and told me, Man of God, I want you to pray with me. My father has been sick, and uh, they went to see someone and auntie advised them that there is a doctor, a local doctor, who can be able to heal them. And he instructed them to bring a black cock to sacrifice and shed blood. And then I don't know whether I go a goat. Such are things, beloved, were done away with when Jesus died on the cross. Let's review the time prophets of Daniel chapter number 9 again. We have our 490 years, all 70 weeks for the Jews, which starts 457 BC. 483 years, all 69 weeks, brings us to the Messiah's baptism in AD 27. Then three and a half years after his baptism, Christ died on the cross in the early part of AD 31. The middle part, that is the middle of that final week of, the, of seven years. Then, three and a half years after Christ's crucifixion, the gospel went to the Gentiles. What happened? Acts chapter 7 verse number 54 to 60 tells us, and even Acts chapter 8 verse number 1 to 4 confirms that, that was in the latter part of AD 34. That was in the latter part of, uh, 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 during that part of AD 34, at the end of the 90, 490 years for the Jews, uh, what happened? If you are registered as a participant, then you can be able to receive a copy of that diagram uh, as you come, uh, as you go out tonight. You will have that. We can see tonight that actually Bible prophecy was fulfilled in the life and the ministry of Jesus. He fulfilled the time prophecy of Daniel chapter number 9. But Christ died on the cross that day for our sins. And death is where every biography ends. There is actually nothing more uh, final than death. A Roman soldier, to confirm, had to thrust a spear into uh, his side to ensure that he was dead completely. It was all over for Jesus if he was just a good man, a philosopher, or a prophet. After his death, Christ's followers took his body off the cross. And what happened? And put it into a cold, dark, damp tomb. The history and the story was finished for Christ. If he was just but a good man. But that is not uh, where the biography of Jesus ends. He came forth from the tomb. A victor over death and the grave. And that event too was foretold in the Old Testament. In the book of Psalm chapter 16 verse number 10. We serve a risen Savior. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you, beloved, the founder of every other world religion is in the tomb today. The founder of every other religion in the world is in the tomb today. Beloved, including Charles, where is he? And evolution, and yes, evolution is a religion, a serious religion, beloved. It takes more faith to believe in evolution than it takes to believe in creation. But where is Charles Darwin? Right here. Beloved, but the founder of Christianity is alive. Always challenge you. The founder of Muslim or Islamic religion, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is still in the tomb. But the founder of Christianity is alive. Praise the Lord. He is his is an empty tomb. He lives. How much could you actually, how much power could you uh, uh, get from a religious leader who is in the grave? None. But Jesus is not in the grave today, beloved. And because he lives, he can impart to me personal power. And that is why the Bible says in John chapter number 1 verse number 12, read with me together, beloved, as many as received Jesus, to them he gave because Jesus died for my sins, he can forgive me, beloved. Buddha didn't die for my sins. Muhammad didn't. Confucius didn't. But Jesus did. 
so he can't forgive me. He is the lamb that was slain to atone for sin. He died to atone for my sins. And that is why the Bible says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. John chapter number 1, verse number 28, 29. All the lambs that died in the Old Testament symbolized Jesus. The Lamb of God, who will take away the sins of the world, dying to pay the price for sin. The Bible says, the wages of sin is what? Death. Jesus died to pay the price for your sins and mine. And because he paid the penalty for sin, he can forgive you. The Bible says in John, 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9, If we confess our sins, he, that is Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He alone, beloved, can be able to forgive you because he paid the price for your sins. But someone says, I don't think he could forgive my sins. I'm just too a bad person. Beloved, I remember at one time preaching in Mombasa. And a lady told me in a retreat, Man of God, I've done eight abortions. I do not think that God can forgive my sins. Whenever the thoughts could come back, whenever she could think about what she has done, she was always traumatized. But beloved, not only her, I remember one time doing a meeting in Mwingi. A man came to me and told me the last time I was in church was way back in 1983. Over 40 years now, I've never been to church. I'm not sure whether God has got a big sack to carry my sins. He will not. And I'm not ready to give back my life to him. They are too heavy for him. Beloved, listen to what the Bible says. Does the text say that Jesus will forgive our sins except for abortion? Except for your sin? No. If we will confess, he will forgive. And that is a divine promise. Conversion means you are acknowledging your sin and giving your guilt to Jesus. For example, suppose I have a 1,000 Kenya shillings and I give it to you. Beloved, how much do I remain with? nothing. Who has the 1,000? It is you. Beloved, that is exactly what you can do with your guilt. You can give it to Jesus. He promises. When you give out your guilt to Jesus, don't take it back again. He takes it. He's actually he's paid the penalty for it. Either tonight, you are carrying a heavy burden of guilt. You've been thinking about self-abuse. You have talked to young people have done events and meetings with young people, and especially ambassadors during camp meetings. I remember one young man told me, I'm burdened with the sin of self-abuse, masturbation. I'm not sure whether this thing can go out of me. Beloved, I'm telling you this. He takes it. He has paid the penalty for it. Either tonight you are carrying a heavy burden of guilt all because you've confessed your sins to Jesus, you are freed from that burden. And more than that, he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That is to a divine promise. Tonight, beloved, I point you to the Lamb of God, Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega of your salvation. Behold the Lamb of God, the one who died that you might live eternally. Someone once said, Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which we had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the, 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 the which was his. Beloved, with his stripes, we are healed. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Because Jesus died for my sins, he can forgive me, beloved. He is alive to do that today. And because he's alive, he can empower me. We need to believe. And that is why the Bible says, read with me, beloved, as many as received Jesus, to them 
he gave power. Beloved, I have a question for you tonight. Have you received Jesus? You say, how can I receive Jesus? There are just five simple steps to receiving Jesus. Five simple steps to receiving Jesus. Number one, you must acknowledge that you are a sinner and in need of a savior. Acknowledge that you are a sinner. If you don't sin, you don't need a savior. You must first admit that you are a sinner in need of a savior. Number two, beloved, you must believe that Jesus died for you and for your sins. If he didn't die for you, you have no hope. I believe Jesus will have died if, if on if you had been the only one that would have been saved. That is how much he loves you. Beloved number three, come to Jesus just as you are. Don't think of going back to make yourself better before coming. Come as you are with your guilty and sin. The repentant thief on the cross besides Jesus actually came as he was. He hadn't done penance or good works. Yet Christ accepted him and he will accept you too. Number four, beloved, confess your sins to Jesus. Be specific in your confession. You know what, you are, what the kind of sins uh, you are doing? Confess them to him. And, that is, and what is the promise? If we confess our sins, what will he do? He will forgive us. If you are a thief and you are struggling, you are revising for exams, Instead of revising and trusting in the Lord to pass, you are doing some Makenyas. Tell God I'm struggling with theft of exams. You see, there are people who can never be honest. Eh? I remember uh, people used to say in school, at e, e degree ni Arambe. See Arambe, if you have such a problem, hmm? eh? you have such a problem. Eh? We used to have someone in our class called Makeo in primary school. Ata ukiwa huko, we unainua tukaratasi hivi. And he's able to, I don't know whether he, has a, he had a Zuma. You see, beloved, if you're struggling with that, you're struggling with other sins, other burdens, be specific and tell God, I'm a, I'm a serious thief, yes. I'm a, I'm a, 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 be specific and direct to your sins. And then number five, invite Jesus to come into your life, into your heart, and be your personal savior. Companion, and a friend and give you his power to live the Christian life. You do these five simple steps in your personal prayer. You don't need a script. You can pray in your own words and ask God to lead you. In prayer you say, dear Jesus, I acknowledge that I am a sinner in need of a savior. I believe, dear Jesus, that you died for me and for my sins and so today I'm coming to you just as I am, I confess my sins to you, Lord. Be specific when you confess your sins to Jesus. Ask him for forg to forgive you and then invite Jesus to come into your life and give you power and thank him. Thank him for forgiving you. Thank him for being your savior. Thank him for giving you is actually our presence and power. And beloved, you do all this in your own words. It's really just that simple. You don't need a professional script. God wants to hear our prayers marked by our own individuality. God will hear you if you will pray sincerely. There, you have the five simple steps to receive Jesus. Beloved, in Revelation chapter number 3, verse number 20, Jesus says to you, Behold, I stand at the door. And do what? Knock and if any man do what? And will sup with him and he with me. The door represents your choice, beloved. How do you receive someone that comes to your home? You open the door, of course. And beloved, you must open the door and then you must invite them to come in. It is the same with Jesus. Invite him to come into your life, to be your savior and Lord. When you do that, you are receiving Jesus, uh, which means you receive power. Tonight, beloved, the Alpha and Omega of the knocking at your heart's door. Will you let him in? Will you receive Jesus and his power? That is the question. Beloved, 
Will you accept Christ Jesus? There is hope for you, beloved. Christ is pleading voice you must receive. There is hope for you in Jesus Christ alone you must believe. There is hope for you. Salvation is a gift you must receive. So there is hope in Christ for you. There is hope for you. Christ stands at your heart's door. There is hope for you. The price of sin for you he bore. There is hope for you. Receive his power and so much more. Yes, there is hope in Christ for you. The Bible says, let's read together, beloved, once again. As many as received him, to them he gave what? Power. Have you received Jesus? Would you like to receive him tonight? We are going to do something very special as we conclude our meeting this very evening. And we will have several moments of silent prayer. And I am inviting you to talk to Jesus in your own words. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal savior, then tonight in silent prayer, invite, I invite you to receive Jesus as your personal savior and Lord. You may be a backslidden Christian. You once knew Jesus, but you've fallen away from him. And tonight, you want to receive him back into your life. You can do that tonight. And beloved, you can only do that in your silent prayer. There may be a Christian here tonight, but you feel powerless to live the Christian life. Beloved, maybe your heart is filled with bitterness, filled with guilt, filled with shame for sin. Maybe you have a bad habit you need victory over. Why not lay that burden down upon Jesus? The lamp of God tonight. You can walk away from this meeting free in Christ Jesus. Actually empowered to do what you know is right. I want that power, beloved. Don't you want the same power? Oh yes. Let's stand together. Let's stand together for prayer. And we begin with several moments of silent prayer. We will, we will take a moment of silence to talk to God in our personal words that God's will may be done. God's will may be done this very evening as we seek for the face of the Lord in prayer. I want us to take a moment of silence as we seek for the face of the Lord in prayer this evening together as we seek for his face. So beloved, I want you to talk to God in your personal words. Make sure that you talk to God in uh, a language that he understands and he is able to forgive you. He will take care of you and he will take care of your burdens. Just in a moment of silence. In your own words, plead with God.
I want us to pray. Our Father and our God who lives in heaven, glory and honor be unto you forever. We are so grateful that you've talked to us on the secret of receiving the power to overcome all habits that have enslaved us in this present life. In the mighty name of Jesus, we bind and cast out the demonic forces and these agencies from our midst. And Lord, we want to invite you unto us. Lord of heaven, we pray that, Lord, you may forgive us of our sins. Whichever the sins that we are doing, many of us are addicted into social media. Many of us are addicted into watching vice. Many of us are unable to break from the chains of immorality and equal from the shackles of our pornography. Many of us are struggling with self-abuse. Many of us are struggling with that dirty thoughts and pure reasonings. Or many of us, we are unclean and tainted in every form. And we are coming unto you, Lord, asking for forgiveness. Wash us with thy blood that was shed on the cross. Give us a power to overcome every form of sin. Lord of heaven, we want to pray that you May as we have flowed our burdens unto you, Lord, we trust in you, in our conviction, that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us as your children. I want to thank you for your children. These students who are sacrificing every night to come into this meeting. Lord, one thing that I'm praying for is a blessing upon each one of them. Bless them in the academics. Some of them are doing cuts in Jesus name give them a giant memory Lord even as they do revision tonight after leaving these events I pray that direct them to peruse and even revise at the exact places where the cuts are going to be set Lord keep your words and your promises in this I want to pray that every minute that has been spent in your feet in the mighty name of Jesus it is not in vain many of them are struggling financially for the things of this present life. Some of them were not able to eat. Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you may open the windows of heaven because they are making a genuine sacrifice for you. The visitors that we are inviting every night, Lord, bless them mightily. Let your name be glorified. May you be lifted up. Thank you because you care and you love us. We want to thank you that tonight as we part ways, Lord, we have always burdened, we have always struggling with the diseases, any other form of malady, anything else that may be bothering us, in the mighty name of Jesus, we surrender our lives unto thee. Guide us all the way. Let your name be glorified. Now and forevermore is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, our subject for tomorrow is a worldwide shutdown. Christ returns. And I want to wish you God's blessings as we look forward into meeting tomorrow again for our study.